Now on Facebook Live and RadioBuzz.com, this is Live with Teresa Van Zeller. Hi, welcome back. Live with Teresa Van Zeller. I am so pleased to be here. And today I have got some very special guests that I am fortunate to call very dear friends as well. Anybody who has taken a hypnosis course, um, I don't know of any who don't teach, about the Dave Elman techniques, who was quite famous in the 50s and 60s. And I have with us today his son, Larry Elman, and his wife, Cheryl Elman, who are going to talk to us for a bit. And they're actually going to be back in a month because there's just only a half hour on this show and there's so much to talk about. But uh, I am very excited and pleased to announce that they're here, here with me today. Cheryl, Larry, are you there? We're here. Yes, we are. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, thank you for being here. I know I kind of, uh, I've been going through some personal stuff with some relatives and you guys, as usual, jumped to my side and, and were here for me. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. How are you both doing? Yes. Good. We are en route from the Heartland Hypnosis Conference, where we both just presented during the weekend, heading home. And so you are our rest stop. Oh, well, hopefully I can give you a happy reprieve because we love talking to each other. You know, it's interesting because I'm also an accountant and Larry, uh, has, what, what, it, what was his job title? He graduated from MIT, is absolutely brilliant when it comes to computers. What did he do at MIT? Uh, aeronautics and astronautics. Basically, that means I can build you an airplane or I can build you a spaceship. The big difference oh. is your budget. Oh, uh, wonderful. <laughs> Let's go traveling. <laughs> um, I'm very excited because uh, you do teach. Uh, tell me a little bit about your father, Dave Elman, who uh, was uh, pretty big in the hypnosis industry. He wasn't a doctor, but he basically trained doctors and dentists about hypnosis for anesthesia as well as other issues. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about him? Because we have a lot of hypnotherapists listening, but we also have a lot of um, just listeners that love the subject of hypnosis. So I'd like to educate them a little bit about Dave Elman. Please tell us a little bit about him. Certainly. Uh, my father became uh, fascinated by hypnosis after it was used as pain control when my grandfather was dying. And so he studied it and developed his own techniques uh, starting about age eight or nine and running into his high school years. He then joined vaudeville as a stage hypnotist, was a stage hypnotist for a number of years until vaudeville was basically driven out of business by the uh, early movie theaters. And uh, then he was in basically in show business for quite a while, eventually having a radio show, Hobby Lobby, that was sufficiently important so that when Dad had to go into the hospital for an operation, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, came up from Washington, D.C. to run the show till he got out of the hospital. Wow. Uh, when the show went, say again, ma'am? I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you can actually read about that because she has a diary online called My Day. So if you go in there and put in Dave Elman and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you'll hear how what her experience was being an MC. She really enjoyed it. Yeah, and, and we were very, very uh, pleased to have her and to know her. Uh, anyhow... Uh, about the time that was ending, a committee of doctors came to my father and asked him to teach medical hypnosis. And his reply was, uh, I'm not a doctor. How would I know medical hypnosis? And they pointed out to him three things that were critical to them. One was the speed of induction because they were seeing five patients an hour. So a 20-minute induction doesn't do them any good. A two- or three-minute induction does them a lot of good. The second was that 
if he went to hypnotize 10 people, he got 10 people hypnotized. Uh, from a physician's point of view, that sort of reliability was quite important. And lastly, if he gave a post-hypnotic suggestion, it took, since post-hypnotic suggestions to a doctor are as important as a prescription written for the local pharmacy, uh, again, reliability was the uh, important thing. So he spent the next 15 years teaching physicians and dentists uh, medical hypnosis. And then he had a heart attack, and after that, he mentored some people, but no longer could do the sort of teaching he had done earlier. Uh, during his teaching, there were a couple of highlights worth mentioning to, uh, to everybody. One was uh, a gentleman who was so weak, yet so in need of heart surgery, that the cardiologist said if he doesn't have the surgery immediately, he will die. And the physiologist said, yes, but we have no drug gentle enough to give him anesthesia for that sort of operation, considering his bad health. The two of them had been my father's students, so they called my father and said, what do we do now? And Dad said, I don't know. And one of them said, could you hypnotize somebody with enough pain control to go through open heart surgery and stay alive and given his health condition throughout an operation? And my father said, it's never been tried. And they said, well, be in the oper operating room tomorrow at about 9 a.m. We're going to try it and you're going to be there and you're going to run the hypnosis end of it. Uh, the patient survived and went on to a good life. And uh, I think that was the first time that had ever been tried. And uh, we're, we're kind of proud of that in the family. Well, of course. And I know they've done at least 18, I think, uh, that was as of years ago, open heart surgeries. And we're talking ribs, stretchers, and everything. To be able to do that um, is absolutely amazing because we can shut off the messages from the brain that actually create pain. And hypnosis is so powerful, and it's simply utilizing the power of that individual's mind and having somebody who is uh, properly trained to be able to conduct it. And they worked with this man um, just the first time out, because I know when I went through my training, we were taught you work with somebody a minimum of three months before you try something like that. But this was literally first time in. He hadn't worked with them before. Had no choice. Uh, the first thing he knew of it was the night before they did the operation. And given the man's health, they didn't expect him to last out a week unless they operated. So it was uh, <laughs> three months was not an option. Oh, my. That is so absolutely amazing. And I know that your father's book and I meant to pull it out of my shelf. I actually have two of them. I have the red copy you're going to sign for me. Um, what is that book title? Hypnotherapy. That's it. It was just that one line thing, and it's a wonderful book, and he has just case study after case study with all the different things that he's worked with. And, you know, that brings to mind, too, we were talking a while back about you coming out with a subsequent book, um, that kind of emulated the stories in that book with current case studies. Are you guys still working on that? We're working on it, but it's a long, slow effort, uh, simply because we'd like to keep the quality high and we need the cooperation of a large percentage of our students. Uh, since about 2009, We've been uh, teaching hypnosis, in our case, not just to doctors and dentists, but to hypnotists, because we're teaching the uh, more advanced stuff usually. And in that time period, we've uh, went on through, uh, I believe it's 18 countries, honey? Yeah, we have, we have traveled and taught in 18 different countries, some of them two and three times. So that's the main reason we had tabled that for the moment. 
But actually, Teresa, one of the things we're doing is so many people want a more complete um, a complete reference to the Dave Elman induction, especially, you know, not just it's not magic words, it's processes, finding out how to troubleshoot the different parts of it, the history of Dave. So we are putting one out probably, um, hopefully soon, uh, within the next year is my goal. And, um, and, also, and, and in that, there'll be also a bunch of the case histories. It may not follow the same exact format, and go in a slightly different direction, but that would be able to be translated into all different languages. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, and you know, while we also have a, I'd like to call it a book, but that's an ego trip. It's more a, a pamphlet. It's intended to take uh, my father's induction and have the person using it treated as a process, not a script. And that's been on sale for about five years now, and uh, an awful lot of people have bought it, used it, and said, wow, I get better results that way. Um, we also have been making DVDs of our teachings, and uh, we also have some, uh, some other recordings of my father's and some other books that uh, I've written and some articles and things of that nature. So I think I think um, that a lot of people out there today in this climate are are switching careers. I think years ago people um, stayed, you know, they got a job and they stayed 30, 40 years in that job. And today, in today's job market and just the way the whole climate is, um, you don't necessarily build that pension for 40 years the way you used to. So I think people do more swapping around of careers. Do you find the same thing, Teresa? Absolutely. And now they're saying that the average person uh, changes careers on average three times in their lifetime, major career shifts. And I know when I got into it, I was accounting full time and I trained through the NGH to get my hypnotherapy certification and then got into the hypnosis for birth, which exploded because at the time I was the only person that was doing it in California. So it wasn't just pregnant couples. It was who had the sister that wanted to stop smoking or the cousin that wanted to lose weight. And my business just exploded to the point that, thank God, my mother was working for me at the time to take care of the accounting end and my hypnotherapy side grew. And that I have to say, I mean, I enjoy both ends of the work, but it's very interesting. And, and Larry, I think of you too, because accounting is totally left brain. Two plus two is always four. But hypnotherapy, which I originally got into just to uh, for self-improvement, you know, not really planning on starting a practice. But when I realized how quickly and effectively you could affect change in people who are being medicated and going to talk therapists for sometimes 15, 20 years, that with a good hypnotherapist, you get to the issue. Because like any suggestion, when you talk about it week after week, it just compounds it. And you go for years and years where with hypnotherapy, it's more about, well, have you had enough torture in your life? Are you ready to move on? And it's such a wonderful... Uh -huh way to help people. Let's get rid of it and let you start moving in the direction that you want. And it's absolutely been the most rewarding thing in my life. Great. But Thanks. And, and that's what I wanted to say. Larry has had several careers. He was an aeronautical engineer. He taught college uh, computers at colleges. Um, and, and then we taught aviation. Um, history and then went into teaching hypnosis and for me I was a teacher um, and I um, taught special ed in elementary ed and then went into sales and marketing in business for 14 years uh, taught had an arts and craft mobile company and then went into hypnosis so I think I think a lot of people go wow you know I'm I'm too old I can't change and it's like when you come into each career, you take yourself all the skills, all the interpersonal uh, communication skills you have, all, all of the skills you've had within the positions you've had, 
all the experiences, you. absolutely. Totally a newbie. And so then it builds from there. So that, I think that's important when people think, oh, let me think about becoming a hypnotist. I think that that really helps to, you know, it, um, to to give them the confidence to do it because you have so many of these skills. That's right. Uh, and you have these experiences. Go ahead, Larry. I'm sorry. I very, I very much agree with Cheryl. And I'll expound a moment on what she said. My mother uh, was a housewife and then a secretary. She'd been a secretary when she met Dad. And uh, suddenly he's teaching hypnosis. Well, within a couple of years, she was a superb hypnotherapist. Now, he taught only doctors and dentists, but he'd teach in, say, uh, half a dozen different cities at a time, driving between them, going in a circuit among the cities, uh, teaching in that same city maybe a week later, which gave the doctors an, an opportunity to practice. Well, Cheryl wasn't a hypnotist when I got uh, started back into it. But by a year later, she'd been certified, and we go around teaching uh, as a team. So I, I feel like uh, she's emulating my mother in a way, and both of them are proof that a uh, smart woman is somebody to be really respected. <laughs> That's right. That's Thank right. You. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you guys do make a great team. And and that's something that I find very important too, which we don't see in a lot of training courses that are out there, especially when it's like a condensed one where the practice is what's really important. And and while you're taking the training, you need to work with people while supervised because things are gonna come up. And and the nice thing is, you know, the students always say the same thing. I'll never be as good as you. It's like the only difference between me and you is experience. And with that comes the confidence because seriously, if you have confidence as a hypnotist and you're working with somebody and they respect you and they believe that hypnosis is going to help, you could tell them to stand on one leg, drink three sips, sips of water, turn around and you're going to be cured. And if they buy it, if they believe it's going to work. It really does. And that's what's been always, I don't have them do that. Of course, that's silly, but I mean, there, it is so simple to help them affect change and to watch this overnight blossoming of somebody who, who uh, has been shy or afraid to go out into their own business. And that's the nice thing is with hypnotherapy, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You're, you're working your day job or night job, whatever. You're seeing people one at a time and each person that you work with, your confidence builds. And it's important to have like a mentor, somebody that you can call and talk about stuff with. Now, that's something I want to ask you because you guys do do like a, a nine or 10 day condensed training. Do the people get a chance yeah. to um, practice? I know that mine usually runs six or seven months and we do like one day a week um, and they go and work with people and come back. Do you find that the six or the nine, 10 condensed course, um, are they coming out working? Are they coming out confident? Yes, yes they are. One of the reasons is they must practice two or three times every day. So we'll break, spend quite a bit of time on practicing. We'll then come back and have them um, compare notes and criticize each other and say, uh, you did well, but this and so distracted me. Uh, and, and so they are in effect both practicing and teaching each other. And another thing you should realize is one of the reasons that we're condensed down into successive days rather than spread out as you are is that most of our students come from far away. Of course. Uh, we of had course. one student who called us on a Thursday from Tokyo, Japan and started on the course Saturday. Uh, it's kind of like 
pretty fast and from pretty far away. Obviously, she is not going to fly in from Tokyo, take two days, fly back, and then come back again a month later. It's not economically feasible. Right. So when you have students from all over the world, you must run the way we do. So also the long days and the fact that many people do, like our last class, we had people from all different states and then somebody from Brazil, somebody from Australia. They generally all stay mostly at the same hotel. So they get to continue practicing on each other in the evenings, which is not unusual. And the nice thing about that is they really seem to bond. So they'll have, you know, they'll have continued, um, uh, like a, a dialogue going right now from our last class, their emails several times a week of different people sharing from the different of uh, what's going on with them and what the, what they did with the client, and so it becomes it, it it becomes a close group, you know, being there together for you know long days and and events like that. It's oh yeah, an immersion. Yeah, and then they, yeah, total immersion, and and they support each other, and they do stay in contact afterwards, because this is a life-changing mm-hmm. event. When you become a hypnotherapist, it's not just about working with other people. You're improving your own life skills, and especially if you've right. been totally left-brained. I mean, hypnosis, two plus two is never four. Sometimes it's one and a half plus two and a half. I mean, it's always a gray area, and there's no right or wrong way for anybody to experience it because you're using their life's experiences and everything and incorporating how you work with them in utilizing what works for them because 10 different people will have 10 different ways of getting where they need to go to achieve their goals. And that's the fun part. That's the creative part and the immersion with my baby classes, those usually were once a week for four weeks, but I'd have people coming in from Denmark or Tokyo and we'd put the four classes into three consecutive nights and they lived, ate and breathed hypnosis uh, a week before their due date. And they would do fantastically well because it's also very powerful if, and you need to practice it, but they had been practicing and they're very motivated and they would have just as good, if not better results because their motivation, nobody takes a trip to go far away to take a class unless they want to do good at it. And they did dedicate the practice and everything. And it just doesn't matter if it's a shorter period or a longer period. They both have their benefits. Right. Now, another thing we do is um, we also always bring in guest speakers over Skype or Zoom from all over the world. So the advantage of us going all over the world is getting to know people. And we visit their classrooms and they visit ours. So now you're getting to learn. Uh, from the specialists within their field, and they'll come in for an hour to two and teach the class. So they get exposure. And and Dave Ellman was always of the opinion, don't just learn from me. Uh, Jerry Kine used to say the same thing from Ami. Don't just learn from me. Learn from others too. Learn other methods. I love when I see people that have been in the field 30 years still attending classes. And you always, as as uh, as uh, Helen Midas from Australia said, you know, she goes, oh, I just got the nougat. I came from Australia to, just to this here. Just got that p- little piece of information that's going to make a shift in my practice. So, that's right. And that's uh, all it, that that's right. all it takes. Because right. you can go Larry, take what a- you say? At, at the conference that just ended yesterday. Um, I attended a, uh, a talk by a gentleman who had been in our class about a month before. This man had been doing hypnosis professionally for almost 40 years, but he took our class and then I attended his and the two of us were exchanging uh, case studies, we were exchanging tips and tricks. Uh, it was delightful. And this is the same thing Shaw was saying. And, uh, oh, we, we had a big thrill in Las Vegas uh, last year. We ran into a man, elderly man, who had actually taken my father's course. Now, understand, I'll be 80 later this year, and I went through Dad's course 
for the first time when I was 11 years old. So to run into somebody significantly older than I am, who actually was in Dad's course, was just thrilling to me. Absolutely. Uh, and what what happened? Same thing as with the gentleman that I just described that uh, I saw this at this conference. The two of us sat down and we were swapping. Gee, this is how you approach this type of person. Now, if they respond such and such, what do you do? And so on and so forth. And this is just delightful. That had to be absolutely thrilling. And, and you know, you bring up an interesting point, too, because I do the same thing. When somebody takes your class, they tend to take on your mannerisms, your words and everything. You need to go see other people. Um, I talk slower. Some people talk quicker. Uh, different techniques. And sometimes, you know, I've gone to the NGH conference so many times, and they have all sorts of presenters. And it's interesting how different every person is is but you find that even if it's not the best presentation or whatever there's usually that diamond that that phrase learning how to word use the word find or you'll find that or this will cause that those are all subconscious words that create like an excitement and expects an ex expectation that ends up uh getting them exactly where they need to go and it's an exciting concept, and you only learn that from learning other people because even when I've re retrained people that, that I won't mention the school, but they come out just basically learning suggestions and stuff, um, I'm telling them in the beginning segment of the course, I'm not teaching them anything they haven't heard before, but because I have a way of presenting it or because their frame of mind is differently, they're actually hearing it now. And it's like they're hearing it for the first time, but I know they've learned this before. And it's just a matter of building that rapport and the trust and creating the safe environment where they will work with somebody, even though they're scared to death in the beginning and realize that you're not going to screw up. I mean, if you say something wrong, you just rephrase it. And and that's where the confidence comes from. And that is so important when it comes to hypnotherapy. Well, that's, that, that brings to mind something. Too many hypnotists do not test the, the uh, client for depth and for, uh, for um, accepting suggestions, so on and so forth. Oh, that makes and me I nuts. Have a right always testing and what they what they don't realize is the client sitting in the chair hasn't seen the technique before so they have no idea what pass or fail is so you just give the test and you say that's right you're doing fine meanwhile they're convinced they're in hypnosis you've gotten the information and everybody's cool with it so that's right technique we heavily push. And I'm glad to hear that because I've known some top hypnotherapists that don't do depth testing. And it's because of their lack of confidence because they're afraid it's not going to work. And I say, but they don't know what's expected. And if it doesn't, there's, there's a multitude of, we don't call them tests, we call them exercises or whatever, because some people don't like the word test, but they're going to get a positive reaction from one of them. And that's all they need is to see that their mind-body connection created the desired result. Boy, this is going quick. We've only got a few minutes to go. And I know we could go for hours when we talk. Um, we always do. We usually do when the three of us get together for dinner or whatever. I know, and I yes. miss you guys so much. Um, Thank let us you so much for inviting us, and we'll just be, have to keep coming back and do it a little bit at a time. Absolutely, and we are going to have you. Thank you for bringing that up, Cheryl, because I do go off on tangents. We are going to have you back on May 28th, and it's going to be on Sleep Talk. Can you just give us a taste without giving too much away? Because this is fascinating, sure. I'm sure. Sleep, the, golden process, the golden process of Sleep Talk for Children is a, a process that uh, we train parents to talk to the children two to three minutes a night and um, while they're sleeping. And this helps build the child's their self-esteem and builds an emotional resilience. And so it, it 
takes a lot of the negativity and things that come into their life and, and through this positive suggestion of this process, really builds life-changing um, formulated ideas for that child to go into adulthood. It's phenomenal. And, and it really creates a whole shift in the family. Oh, yeah. And that's absolutely brilliant because we know that the one sense that never goes away, I mean, when you sleep, you're not seeing, you're, you know, but the hearing never goes away. So to be able to give these kids suggestions while they sleep, I wish to God I knew, I know, knew what I knew now when my kids were little. But uh, Lord knows they've thrown my own stuff back at me many times as far as positive suggestions and everything. So they certainly picked it up. But that is absolutely fascinating and i'm looking very forward that to when we talk about that because so many parents i mean so many kids are considered add adhd when in reality they just learn different from other people they don't fit into the parameters so um to be able to work with them and it certainly doesn't bother them and it's conditioning to your voice and they do hear it while they sleep, that just sounds absolutely thrilling in itself. Great. Great. We look forward to it. Me too. And we'll have you on video next time. And all I can do is thank you from the bottom of my heart because, you know, I've had a rough week. And uh, thank you for agreeing to come on today because, God, I miss you guys. We're just going to have – are you going to be in California anytime soon? No, we're going to be in Las Vegas in August. Why don't you oh. pop over and visit? I just may do that. I just may do that. Um, yeah, okay. We haven't seen you since last time we saw you in Vegas several years ago. It's been a few years, I know. I know. So we will work on that. In fact, in fact I'll be teaching a two-day sleep talk class there. Really? Well, yeah, that's most that's interesting. interesting. All yeah, right. so... Uh, I'll get you more info on that, but that is cool. That's absolutely certain, and I want to hear more information on it. And I'm going to send you a couple of books, so you'll get those in the next few days. And for now, I just want to thank you so much because this has been so enjoyable. It went even quicker than I anticipated. But uh, we will talk between now and the 28th, and I am looking forward to having you guys on again. You are being so gracious and uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the week. And for our listeners out there, I want to thank you for joining us. And a uh, better life, a better you. Have a great week. And we will be here next week at 1 o'clock. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye. Bye. This has been the Teresa Van Zeller Show. Join us next week at 1 p.m. here at Facebook Live and RadioBuzz.com.